Hello, today we have Miller Puckett from UCSD here. Miller has um, a long history in the computer music world with research and the latest developments. Welcome, Miller. Well, thanks for having me out here. It's, it's a great been a long pleasure. trip. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about Max MSP and Pure Data and what that's all about? Well, those are both programming environments that aim at making it possible for people to make computer music applications that are not uh, available in commercial packages. So, for instance, if you want to invent your own sound algorithm or if you want to have a different kind of interactivity uh, on stage than what is available in, in the standard uh, commercial packages, then you know you just have to program it yourself. So, PD and Max are programming environments which hopefully make it easy for musicians to program their own audio applications. Okay, so this is something that musicians can use to program their own thing. Right, so ordinary computer programming, you frequently have to write tens of thousands of lines before you even see a little button show up on the screen, right? So the idea is the, the sort of substrate of, of just being a program and being able to run and being able to get sound in and out of your program is there but then it's up to you to decide if you want to oscillate or if you want to filter or if you want to sample or something else. You, you make that, you put that together yourself. Okay, so uh, how did you get started in this world of computer music? Well, I studied mathematics um, at MIT and at MIT there was a man named Barry Verko who ran a computer music studio in 1979. I think he'd already been there some years and he taught a course for undergraduates. And so I went and took this course, which was probably available in, in, or that sort of course was probably available only in three or four places in the world at that time. And um, I thought it would be cool to make my own little ditties with a computer, right? And it turned out to be so cool that I gradually forgot about mathematics and <laughs> became a computer music researcher full time. And um, have you done any work you know, some of these things I've seen in computer music have uh, people are building these strange interfaces to control synthesizers. Have you done any of that? I've done a little bit of that myself, and uh, I've seen a lot of other people do a lot of it using PD and Max. Uh, right. Where, for instance, you, you buy an Arduino, which is a little microprocessor, and you use it yep. to collect signals from voltage sources or, or um, um, resistance resistances external to the thing or even drive motors or things like that and then you can easily use Max or PD as the as the computer control that uses those sensors to to do things right. so if you want to for instance design your own kind of elevator you uh, just hook up the sensors and and um, actuators to your little Arduino box and then uh, and then you have Max or PD being the brains behind the operation in some sense yeah, the elevator in my building is not very good, actually. Maybe, uh, maybe this is a solution. Right. Will, uh, does PD crash very often? Uh, anytime you want it to, it'll crash very fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I've seen people do is that um, they use a, a standard instrument and they try and use that to control uh, uh, some computer music. Do you do any of that? Yes, I'm. I've been working with, with guitar and with percussion and with voice as, a, as possible sources of, of computer control and have been doing that for about 10 years now, basically because it's fun. Yeah. It's more fun to look at, I must say, than those people sitting there behind a laptop on screen. Sorry, on, on stage, and they're on stage, and right. you, know, you don't know if they're reading their email or actually playing something. Right, yeah, and, and a large part of what I think about is what, what music performance looks like and how it functions, you know, what, what sort of communication is really happening when you see musicians on a stage. And, and um, if that communication isn't there, then it's less live in some sense. It's, right. it's, a lot of it's visual. And it interactive. Seems to be, yeah. yeah. Although I don't think anyone really understands it. it. It seems clear that if you take the visual along the way, if you put an opaque screen between the performers and the uh, people who were in the same room, I don't think they would get the same experience as, as they do yeah. if they see the players. It, mm -hmm. It's very easy to automate uh, performers out of the music making process. Um, and I'm one of those purists who thinks actually that that kind of automation 
uh, does take something away from the from the experience of a music performance. And yeah. I'm interested in, in trying to find ways of keeping that that aspect of music making alive. Yeah. It proved not to be terribly successful after the 50s. Hmm. <laughs> yes, it was great success in the 50s because it was novel and it was, new. It was cool. Yes. Yeah, but but then, well, you know, it's the Hegelian thing. You, you got you got your violin player and then you got your speaker. And then the question is, you know, how do you make a richer world that actually incorporates both of those possibilities? Yes. And um, just thinking about these, these new interfaces and performances, um, do you ever think that iPads and those sorts of touch interfaces might become an instrument or do you think we might always be stuck with um, the traditional kind of instruments? Well, people have been trying to make new musical interfaces for many years and occasionally they're successful. So my example of a success would be the theremin. Mm -hmm. It's a new interface that works and does it does an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, there aren't very many good examples of that. Um, and I think it's worth continuing to work on, but I, I don't, I wouldn't think personally that the iPad specifically would be a good place to, would, would be a good starting point for making a musical interface because it just doesn't feel like an instrument. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, but it doesn't have the, the right kind of timing. Okay, and do you think there's an element of, um, you know, does virtuosity play a, a, a part here? In the virtuosity of an instrument, or well, it usually does. I mean, any any really successful music instrument has to be something that you can develop virtuosity on. Mm -hmm. But I guess someone could become a virtuoso iPad performer if virtuosity existed. But we would have to figure out what virtuosity would mean in that context, mm -hmm. and that would be a you know that someone would have to work for twenty years to become that virtuos yeah. virtuoso. And to invent what that what that meant, and by that time the iPad not, might not no longer exist, and so you're taking a bit of a risk if you go in that direction. Right? <laughs> Indeed, Miller, I want to thank you very much for popping into Melbourne and popping into Collarts and chatting with everyone. Well, it's a great pleasure, and uh, I this is your first year, I know, and I'm excited to see what becomes of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Miller.